bright lights, packed arenas, the glory, the glamour. The aura created by the NFL gridiron was a sight to behold, or at least that's what it appeared to be. As Hollywood filmmakers would begin to challenge the NFL, the veil of wealth and glory would quickly begin to fade, and the ugly realities of America's beloved game would be revealed. Gene, this year already we've had movies about tennis and bowling and boxing and basketball and bike racing, <laughs> but now comes a film that takes a dramatically different look at sports and serves as an indictment of pro football in particular, and in general the whole idea of winning at any cost. And this Any Given Sunday is a war movie. Where football is this extravagant, gigantic mess of people hurling bodies every which way. Will Smith's latest movie, Concussion. Concern is intensifying and people are questioning whether the beloved sport of football is simply too dangerous. Stop me if you can. This yard of space is called no man's land. The battle for it is a violent one. The 1960s for the NFL was one dominated by gladiators. An era of expansion, grit, genius, and stardom. Spectators were entranced by the violent ballet that was pro football. The thousands of adoring fans, the game-winning touchdowns. To many, it seemed that it didn't get much better than playing in the NFL. Do you know me? I'm one of the best known cowboys in Texas. In 1960, we would see the birth of the Dallas Cowboys, the NFL's first expansion team. And what would become America's team kicked off with humble beginnings. The early 60s were not kind to the Cowboys, with loss after loss. Many players frequently didn't show up to practice, or some even to games. But that would all change for Dallas in 1966. The inception of the famed Doomsday Defense would catapult the Cowboys into the limelight. Led by the likes of Bob Lilly, Chuck Howley, Cornell Green, and Mel Renfro, Dallas was now a team to be feared. However, Dallas was not without offensive firepower. Led by All-Pro quarterback Don Meredith, fullback Don Perkins, and receiver Bob Hayes. The Cowboys went to two consecutive NFL championship games, falling short of the Green Bay Packers, and losing twice to the Cleveland Browns in 1968 and 1969. Like few before him, Pete Gent openly questioned the dehumanizing aspects of the game. Pro football and Hollywood have enjoyed a long relationship, showing very different aspects of the game. Football as a business, that aspect came to light in the movie North Dallas 40. We created a whole new world at the public library. The week in the life of a fictionalized Dallas team, it dealt with violence, drugs, racism. Until then, issues hidden behind the closed doors of NFL locker rooms. Keep in touch with the world. Check into your public library. In 1973, Former receiver for the Dallas Cowboys, Peter Gent, published a tell-all book exposing the dark truth about the NFL, titled North Dallas 40. And in 1979, this best-selling tell-all book would be adapted into a feature-length film and would shake the very foundations of the NFL.
The film North Dallas 40 follows an aging receiver, Phil Elliott, as he battles for the starting spot and attempts to navigate through the hectic and wild world of a pro football player. In the film, Phil Elliott is a fictionalized version of Peter Gent, the author of North Dallas 40. Seth Maxwell is a fictionalized version of Don Meredith, and B.A. Struthers is a fictionalized version of Tom Landry. The North Dallas Bulls are the Dallas Cowboys in everything but name. North Dallas 40 pulls back the veil created by the bright lights and thousands of adoring fans and into the dark life of an NFL player. The constant pain, the sleepless nights, the addiction, a cycle of harm fueled by their love of the game and the game's brutal nature. As Elliot is being worked on and in his administered shots, rookie wide receiver Delma Huddle, who is a fictionalized version of Bob Hayes, approaches and states, how do you take all those pills and shots? It does terrible things to your body. With Elliot responding, you last long enough, you realize that's the only way to survive, is the pills and the shots. Later that week, receiver Delma Huddle injures his hamstring in practice and is helped off the field. Struthers then informs Elliot that he will be starting next game, with it being unlikely that Delma will be able to play. Huddle, now recuperating, does everything in his power to get on the field, except the one thing that will ensure he will. After the shot is administered, the assistant coach approaches Delma encouraging him to do the same as Elliot did, and Delma states that it's dangerous. You don't feel anything. I could tear my hamstring to bits. The assistant coach then states, isn't it about time you start thinking about the team? You can't make it in this league if you don't know the difference between pain and injury. Delma then agrees. It's now the last drive of the game. Huddle catches a quick screen and attempts to run the ball upfield, but re-injures his hamstring and takes a brutal hit, sending him to the turf. His battered face makes him nearly unrecognizable and throws Elliot into a rage. Struthers yells at Elliot to get back into the huddle or get off the field. To Struthers, his players were nothing more than pawns and cogs in a machine. Delma had sacrificed his morals and health for the team's greater good, and when his body failed, he was discarded. Throughout the film, we follow offensive lineman Joe Bob Pretty as he prepares to go against one of the top defensive linemen in the league, Alcee Weeks. Joe Bob is unpredictable and reckless like a coiled spring that at any moment could erupt. Joe Bob makes a few racial remarks at fellow teammate Monroe that ultimately lead to a tense altercation between the two that ends in a fight. Joe Bob proved no match for weeks, applying tremendous pressure on Seth Maxwell. Then during the next play in the huddle, Maxwell tells Joe Bob and Shattuck to trap weeks and break his leg if you have to. And they do just that. The North Dallas Bulls' wild life is highlighted by a series of incidents that occur throughout the film. Elliot goes out with Seth Maxwell and a few other teammates and are all clearly intoxicated. They begin to fire off rounds at everything that moves, at birds, livestock, and mailboxes, and even at each other. Parties of excess, breaking into medicine cabinets. The film North Dallas 40 exposed the NFL for what it truly was, as Nick DeRiso put it, a money first, player disposing corporate Goliath. The coaches cared little about their players' well-being, caring only whether they stepped on the field, no matter the cost. 
The expose of drug use players frequently inherited from the brutality of the sport and the toxic atmosphere created in team locker rooms caused tremendous concern among many, especially the NFL. The NFL was unhappy when they heard this film was in production and were determined to stop it at all costs. Nolte states, The NFL did its best to torpedo the film once its administrators got word that we were in production. They hated the idea that we might tarnish their image if we demonstrated what second-class citizens its players were, regardless of their race, and how terribly crippled almost every veteran became. The NFL, however, failed to derail production. After the film was released, the NFL punished those who had any kind of involvement in the making of North Dallas 40. Hall of Famer Tom Fears, who advised on the movie's football action, had a scouting contract with three NFL teams. All were cancelled after the film opened. Tommy Riemann, an NFL running back who played Delma in the film, claimed that he had been blackballed by the NFL for his participation in the film. Fred Belitnikov, who was the technical advisor for Nolte, who coached him on pass receiving, was cut by the Oakland Raiders following the premiere. John Matusak, who had a speaking role in the film, had trouble negotiating a new contract with the Oakland Raiders. They were convinced Dallas's owners, Tech Schramm and Clint Murchison, had a direct hand in this. Riemann states, I know Roselle's behind this. Schramm and Clint Murchison are powerful men. The author of North Dallas 40 was convinced a conspiracy was at play, claiming the tight relationship between NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle and Cowboys President Tech Schramm could have made it possible. On a brighter note, it's official. Dan Marino has signed that new contract with the Dolphins that will pay him $9 million over the next six years. He's now the highest paid player in pro football. Players need protection on the field, and your new car needs protection too. This is the $40 million contract signed by BYU's All-American quarterback Steve Young with the Los Angeles Express of the USFL. Oh my God. This is redone, $103 million over 10 years. The richest deal in the history of the NFL. As the years passed, the NFL's empire grew exponentially. Multi-million dollar contracts were the new normal. Stadiums towered over their respective cities. And players were now as well known as movie stars. The corporate behemoth that the NFL had become caught the attention of acclaimed director Oliver Stone director of such films as Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK. Stone had wanted to make a movie on American football for years, and with the tide of the sport's corporate culture, now was the time. The brutal hits. The fast pace, and the utter realism makes any given Sunday one of the most honest and powerful football films of all time. Life is a contact sport. In the film, we follow legendary head coach Tony D'Amato of the Miami Sharks, played by Al Pacino. D'Amato has seen plenty of success throughout the course of his career and is now on the decline. As his aging stars and continuous losses causes him to fall out of favor with the young team owner, Christina Pagniacci, played by Cameron Diaz. The cutthroat nature and brutality of the sport are on full display, as Oliver Stone takes you down the brutal reality of the NFL. Tony D'Amato's star, 38-year-old quarterback, is down. Oliver Stone, during production, decided to merge the film Any Given Sunday with another film based on the book You're Okay, It's Just a Bruise, a tell-all book by a former team physician for the LA Raiders, and medical malpractice would be one of the core themes of the film. Veteran quarterback Cap Rooney, a three-time MVP, would take a vicious hit. 
and team physician Dr. Mandrake rushes the field. And while Rooney is seriously injured, he pressures him into getting up on his own, and he walks off the field. Back in the locker room, Mandrake comes back with the x-rays and tells Cap that everything looks fine, but Cap adamantly states that something is definitely wrong. We then cut to Cap in the hospital after surgery, exclaiming that the painkillers they're administering don't work and they need to pump up the volume. I'm a football player for God's sake. Rooney sustained a ruptured disc after the hit. The team's premier defender, Shark LeVay, played by legendary linebacker Lawrence Taylor, credited by D'Amato for revolutionizing his position, is nearing the end of his career as his health begins to rapidly deteriorate, drawing concern from the new intern, Dr. Ollie Powers. Informing Dr. Mandrake that there is something wrong with Shark, stating, he's having trouble focusing and his hand-eye coordination is deteriorating. And Mandrake responds, that they're all messed up. The crazier they are, the more the crowd likes it. Cap then prematurely returns to practice. Dr. Mandrake then explains to Christina Pagniacci, he's so freaked out about Beeman, a young up-and-coming QB played by Jamie Foxx, taking his job, he'd probably play with a fractured neck as he laughs it off. He then discusses Shark LeVay's health, stating, he's got bad migraines, post-concussive syndrome, he's had about three concussions in five months, and he's unsure what another head hit would do to him. Rain floods the stadium as LeVay goes in for the hit. In turn, Dr. Ali Powers has a meeting with Tony D'Amato and Shark LeVay to explain what the test results revealed. That Shark LeVay had a broken neck that never healed properly and states that the wrong kind of hit could result in paralysis, seizures, or even sudden death and states that he is not medically fit to play. But LeVay wants to play, and says that he needs one sack and three more tackles to get his million dollar bonus. He then signs a waiver and is ready to play. D'Amato then confronts Dr. Mandrake, accusing him of switching Levy's test results so the intern would not find out about his serious neck injury, and Tony D'Amato kicks him off the team. And Dr. Mandrake exclaims that this kind of stuff has been going on for years, and D'Amato has been turning a blind eye to it. D'Amato then checks in on Cap Rooney to ensure that he is ready for the big game. Rooney then discloses to him that he has blank spots in his memory. He shakes and sometimes can't even hold a spoon. But Tony urges him to play and does. Prior to the game, we see Shark LeVay receive an injection into his knee and asks for another at the hesitation of the doctor. Throughout the course of the game, LeVay and Rooney take a series of hits, each hit slowly inching them closer to the end of their careers. And under serious pain, Coach D'Amato decides to put in Willie Beeman in the second half. With the game on the line, on a crucial fourth and one, the Shark stands between loss and victory and LeVay makes the stop, but at a cost. And after being initially unresponsive, LeVay awakes and asks if he made the stop, and is filled with delight as he is stretchered off the field, knowing he made his million dollar bonus. The wealthy elite perched in the owner's box and watched like Roman senators as gladiators fought to the death. For ownership, they did not consider players people, but livestock, cogs, or drones. We follow Christina Pagniacci, the owner and general manager of the Sharks, who inherited the team from her father. To her, the game is simply a business and does not take into account anything but numbers, attendance rate and profit margins. For example, when her veteran quarterback goes down, she simply picks up the phone and starts looking at available free agents. Or when she is aware of Shark LeVay's serious neck injury 
and that just one more hit could cause paralysis, she instructs Mandrake to fake the test results and let him play, and in the offseason will cut him. In the bar, Tony D'Amato and defensive coordinator Monty Monroe, played by legendary running back Jim Brown, reminisce on how football used to be, like in high school, when the sport was pure. When rumors began to swirl about Oliver Stone's intentions to create a football movie showcasing the darker side of the sport, the NFL wanted no part of it and went to war to try to derail the project entirely. The film was delayed four times during production, with the NFL catching wind of the film's intentions. Originally, the Miami Sharks portrayed in the film were supposed to be the Miami Dolphins, but the NFL pulled their support as soon as they understood Stone's direction. They despised the script and told all NFL players, former and current, not to take any part in the film. And in trying to gain access to a stadium for filming, the NFL ensured they had as much trouble doing so as possible. If it were not for one rogue owner, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones lending them access to the Texas stadium, some of the film's realism may have been lost. However, even after the film's completion, the NFL's war with Oliver Stone on any given Sunday was not over. Oliver Stone states, and then when the film came out, the NFL went out of its way to completely blackball us, Stone continued. There was no coverage from the sports shows. It was not fun to fight them. It's like fighting the Pentagon. North 40 Dallas had focused in on the NFL's drug problem. Any given Sunday had focused in on the corporate juggernaut the NFL had become. However, any given Sunday had touched on a subject that would hit the mainstream nearly 10 years later. We have another disturbing health headline this morning. One week before the Super Bowl, the NFL says concussions soared to a four-year high this season. Uh-oh, your headache starts to pound. You play football on a Saturday and suffer a violent blow to your head. You've suffered brain damage. Its tension tightens your nerves. Almost every play of every game and every practice, they're going to be hitting their heads against each other. Each time that happens, it's around 20 G or more. That's the equivalent of driving a car 35 miles per hour into a brick wall. A class action lawsuit being filed this morning against the National Football League by players who allege the NFL misled them for decades about the risks of brain injury. Bottom line. Is football too dangerous a sport? Next, tackling the problem of concussions and the NFL's response past and present. It comes as a new movie opening this week, zeroes in on the sport and one of the key researchers who pushed the league to change its approach. Feel it? Before you reach the end of your rope, reach for help. In the film, we follow Dr. Bennett Omalu, played by Will Smith, who is a neurologist out of Pittsburgh, as the city mourns the loss of one of their beloved Steelers, Mike Webster. In charge of Webster's autopsy is Dr. Omalu. Omalu was dumbfounded on how and why a man's health could inexplicably degenerate so quickly and wants the brain to be inspected. Upon inspection, he finds tremendous neurotrauma and theorizes that his strange and sudden death was a result of repeated blows to the head that Webster sustained throughout the course of his playing career. Omalu decided to publish an article in Neurosurgery, a medical journal, on his findings of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. The NFL and their team of medical professionals discredited and dismissed the study as blatantly false. However, a series of mysterious deaths of former NFL players under similar circumstances to Webster would cause Omalu to affirm his belief that CTE was indeed very real and was at the root of these sudden and unfortunate passings. Even after a presentation on the findings to the NFL, he still was not taken seriously. 
pressure begins to mount as the NFL begins to follow Umalu and his family and threaten him with arrest and even deportation. He is forced to move from Pittsburgh and relocates to California. Just three years later, Dave Duerson, a former NFL PA executive and former player passes away, leaving a note behind stating, please see that my brain is given to the NFL's brain bank, conceding that Omalu may have been right all along. The pressure soon begins to mount from Congress for the NFL to address the issue. Soon afterward, former players would come in swarms suing the NFL for purposely suppressing and not informing players of the risk of CTE. A spying crushing hit that is at the heart of football excitement, making it America's most popular sport and at the same time, incredibly dangerous. Back up for the season. Now let's get it on. It's amazingly, he'll start tonight after a punishing shot. Get out! Do I or do I not currently have a pulse? Yes, I do. Let's play football. Tonight, the FBI is on the case, and they are warning big companies in America to protect their data after a big Hollywood studio got hit by hackers and several blockbuster movies ended up online. Latest on that major hack attack against Sony. First, the studio's movies were leaked, and now private emails are going public. In 2014, Sony was hacked, and scripts, emails, and films were released, creating a panic in Hollywood. Among these scripts, one was titled Concussion, and upon the film's release the following year, many saw stark differences between the script and the final film, in particular differences that shed the NFL in the more positive light to possibly avoid a potential conflict with the NFL. The original script had Commissioner Roger Goodell portrayed in a more villainous light. In the original script, in his introduction as the new commissioner of the NFL, he states, What I'm here to do now, my main responsibility is to protect the shield, the integrity of the game. There's been some innuendo about the so-called dangers of playing football. I want us to go on enjoying our great game, knowing our kids love it, respect it, never stop having fun. In the final version, what I'm here to do now is protect the shield. The NFL isn't just a sports league, it's an entertainment product, America's game. Goodell is much more critical and dismissive of the accusations made against the NFL. Later in the film, when Doc Romalu is addressing the NFLPA Concussion Committee, the original script had Goodell sitting in the room, staring at Umalu grimly, but this was taken out entirely. Emails were also released that further exposed the NFL's battle with the film. Dwight Keynes, the president of domestic marketing at Sony Pictures, wrote in an email last August, Will is not anti-football, nor is the movie and isn't planning to be a spokesman for what football should be or shouldn't be, but rather is an actor taking on an exciting challenge. We'll develop messaging with the help of an NFL consultant to ensure that we are telling a dramatic story and not kicking the hornet's nest. Another Sony executive suggested that rather than portray the NFL as one corrupt organization, can we identify the individuals within the NFL who were guilty of denying or covering up the truth. In a July 2014 email claims that a Sony lawyer took most of the bite out of the movie for legal reasons. Concussion was able to do one thing the two previous films had failed, use NFL logos, trademarks, and even game footage without the explicit permission of the NFL. Director Peter Landsman stated that he went to the studio wanting to use NFL footage and trademarks and the studio went to work hiring lawyers and removing anything that may result in litigation by the league. He then states, We're protected by fair use and the First Amendment, and if they wanted to bring that to the Supreme Court, they're welcome to. Concussion also successfully aired commercials during sports shows and even NFL games. The NFL didn't put up the fight they did when any given Sunday was released. The NFL had begun to realize they were fighting a losing battle, 
and that it was better just to accept the dangerous aspects of the game and focus on making the game safer. Three films that challenged the NFL's empire. brought them to their knees.